Hi, my name is Rob Shimshok, and today we're here at George Washington University for an event called Express Yourself or Suppress Yourself, Free Speech on Campus. I'm speaking today with Dave Rubin of the Rubin Report, Christina Hoff Summers of American Enterprise Institute, and Steve Simpson of the Ayn Rand Institute. So I guess just to start things off rather generally, guys, um, what do you see as being the single biggest threat to free speech on campus today? Well, I'm sitting next to you, so I can <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that we are taking it away from ourselves. I think that that is the biggest issue. You know, we can talk about the First Amendment and, and legal issues, and I'll, I'll leave that up to Steve. Uh, but in terms of what people are doing, self-censorship to me is now the biggest issue. And where does self-censorship come from? It comes from people being afraid to say what they think because they think the mob is going to get them. And there's so many instances of this. And I see this from college kids all the time that, that message me and they say, I wanted to share your clip, but I didn't want to deal with the aftermath. And if you're afraid to share my clips, then we're really in a lot of trouble. <laughs> so for me, it's self-censorship, but there's a whole slew of problems. Mm -hmm. I would say that the biggest problem on campus is this theory of intersectionality. Mm -hmm. And it's this philosophy about how society is a matrix of oppression. The more oppressed you are, the more prestige you have. It's almost a religion, with sinners being men, uh, and then there, there are these hierarchies out of, out of Dante's Inferno, of, at levels of, of, of uh, complicity in the patriarchy. And it gives people permission to bully others and it's led to these censorship codes, and we have bias, these, these bias response teams on campus rushing in mm -hmm. in case there's a microaggression. This is all coming out of this theory about how we're captive, people are captive to this invidious system of patriarchal, capitalist, colonialist oppression. It's ridiculous, there's no basis in reality, and yet there it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll add just very quickly, I think uh, both Dave and Christina are right. People are definitely censoring themselves. It's definitely a battle of ideas, and I agree with what Christina said. I mean, you can see that in identity politics, multiculturalism, and, and these ideas have been taught in the university for many, many years. And now I think what we're seeing is, is a generation of students who are really taking them seriously. They really buy into these ideas. Um, that uh, that we ought not criticize other people, that we ought to take offense, that, that we're it's essentially you know, groups separated permanently from each other, unable to speak to each other. It's a kind of tribalism. Mm -hmm. And when you reject the idea of Western values, let's put it as Enlightenment values, which are available to anybody, or you reject the idea of reason, of free speech, what do you have? You have just conflict, and that's what we're seeing now. Um, you have force, you have aggression, which is what we saw at Middlebury. Um, and to, to Dave's point, a lot of people, even if they're not buying in whole hog to those theories, they're afraid to speak up because in some way they feel guilty, they feel privileged, they feel like they're part of the oppressive class, and that, that causes people, I think, to silence themselves. And, and by the way, it's not, it's not just those people, it's the people that don't buy into it, but guess what, being called a racist yes. when you're not is not that fun. Yeah. Mm, right. So what advice would you give to a student on campus who perhaps simultaneously wants to express his or her beliefs in class? beliefs that perhaps aren't of the progressive orthodoxy, but also still wants to get good grades and doesn't want to irritate the <laughs> professor. I wish you hadn't added the grade part. I want to answer without the grade part, but look, it, you have to, the three of us are just human beings that happen to be speaking about these things, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what everyone watching this and you are. And we need allies, and the only way you get allies is by people speaking up. If you're not racist, I guarantee you, you're not going to hear one racist, bigoted, homophobic, Islamophobic, other made-up word thing tonight from any of us. You might hear it from someone in the audience, and then we'll <laughs> talk about that, but you're not going to hear it from us. Mm -hmm. And if you're not a racist and a homophobe in those things, then don't be afraid of, of saying what you think, because then you're just holding yourself hostage to ideas that are not yours. Right. Yeah, and I would agree that uh, what students should do is organize around free speech and find a free, sp mm -hmm. free, free speech group on campus. If there isn't one, start one. You can go to groups like the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education or the Ayn Rand Institute. Yeah. There are organizations that will help you do that. And it, I mean, it, campuses have been called islands of intolerance in a sea of freedom. Students should take back their island. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the only thing I'll add to that is I would say speak confidently. Don't apologize for the fact that you have views that challenge whatever it is that you're learning in school. 
Um, don't be don't be tempted to uh, to apologize for your quote privilege or anything else. Consider and, and keep in mind, you know, you're an individual. Students are individuals with individual views. They are not members of some other group, and they are not responsible for the past, you know, heinous injustices of those groups. Uh, as as both Christina and Dave said, join with other people. Challenge the terms. Um, challenge the other side's terms of debate. I think the idea, the whole word, the term Islamophobe, I think, is a corrupt, utterly incorrect term that packages into it the idea that it's it's somehow illegitimate to criticize a religion, let's say, or a body of ideas, when it's of course it's not uh, inappropriate, it's, and it equates it to a uh, to kind of some you know a mental illness or the idea of calling everybody a racist for challenging certain assumptions, that's crazy, and people can't fall into that. They've got to be willing to think for themselves and, uh, and speak out. Right, so turning now to perhaps institutional change, the British Minister for State um, for Universities and Science recently said that universities in the UK will be compelled to uphold free speech for students. And they cited the example that um, you know student buildings, they could not bar students or groups from them based on the beliefs that they hold. And so do you see that perhaps the current administration, Betsy DeVos and uh, Donald Trump, do you see them perhaps taking similar steps? Um, well, I think in general there are some good signs here. I think that the free speech people are, are gaining momentum, which is why exactly why we're doing this here tonight. We are now invited to places to, to push back on this. So I don't know what the administration is going to do. I do. Uh, I was not a Trump supporter, but I do think Trump's win has loosened some of the, the binds around free speech. It has gotten a little easier to talk about things. I don't know if that's directly credited to him. I also worry about an authoritarian side with him. Uh, so I don't know what, what the administration is going to do. But I think the tide is turning a little bit, but that's when we have to put our, our foot on the gas even more. I see a lot of people say, well, you're starting to win a little bit. Maybe ease up. But I would do completely the reverse, actually. And I think what happened at Middlebury College with my colleague, Charles Murray, mm -hmm. Uh, being it, basically silenced by a mob and then physically the, the, the professor that had, was uh, uh, accompanying him was assaulted. I think that this might be a pivotal moment where university administrators and hopefully professors <laughs> will realize that uh, there, we've unleashed a kind of fanaticism on campus it, which is so utterly inconsistent with education and it was a terrible thing that happened but my hope is it opened ideas and raised consciousness and maybe administrators will get the courage to protect their institutions yeah I hope that's happening uh, I think I might be a little less optimistic yeah. <laughs> but it's not so, much. so it's wonderful that people are taking note of this issue I agree wholeheartedly and I think the what happened at Middlebury is a kind of turning point where a lot of academics and administrators are looking at this and saying, what the hell's going on here? You know, yeah. we didn't expect this to happen. But, uh, but whether they're really going to change, I mean, the interesting thing about all of these kinds of episodes is at first there's the outrage and there's this, in a sense there's the backlash, people saying this is horrible. And then, and then you start to see people, you know, the idea trickling back in, that, well, wait a second, after all, Charles Murray is a white supremacist. Even people who are defending his, his free speech call him a white supremacist, <laughs> which, which is he's crazy. Not. He's not. <laughs> and, I mean, you've got to be willing to pay attention and push back against these ideas. Um, Fleming Rose was just protested at Franklin and Marshall, and it's the same kind of thing. A professor wrote a, uh, to the student newspaper defending him, and now there's people, there's other professors attacking, saying, oh, you don't understand how this makes people feel. You don't really understand the postmodernist view of, of speech and how it's really a tool of oppression. So it's a constant battle. Uh, we have to keep fighting the ideas. Uh, a good friend of mine, Nadine Strassen, who's the head of, formal head of, head of the ACLU and a big uh, proponent of free speech, her view is free speech is always under attack yeah. and we always have to be defending it. By the way, I think another good way to fight it is to sh expose these people for the hysterical yeah. nutbags that yeah. they often are. <laughs> <laughs> Christina and I spoke at Portland State <laughs> University and Antifa, who I, they call themselves anti-fascists, but they're actually the yeah. fascists. They're fascists. They issued a statement before we spoke that said that we were anti-queer, I'm gay married, <laughs> and that, that, that Christina is anti-woman. I mean, this is the height of absurdity. And this is, why, this is why they're afraid to debate, and that's why we have to consistently push the debate to them. Because there's, we'll do an hour of Q&A after this, and we're not going to, you say whatever you want. Anyone that's there can say whatever they want, and we'll gladly 
dissect it. And that's how you win with more speech. Yeah. And in fact, the people still, the Antifa defected. I think they heard Milo was speaking somewhere. <laughs> and so they were like, someone more hateful than us. <laughs> but a lot of protesters remained. And what was interesting is at first they were jeering, and then they started to yeah. listen. And by the end, we had a great discussion. Yeah. So yeah, if can, it can happen in Portland, it can happen yeah. anywhere. <laughs> you can actually get through to people, even who their initial view is, you know, you're a hater, you have all kinds of crazy ideas. But if you actually engage with them and you speak to them, you can actually get through to them. Um, and that's a good sign. So we talk a lot about social justice warriors and the, the effect they have, policing language, and perhaps, you know, saying certain jokes that most people would see as harmless as somehow offensive and, you know, injurious to people. But do you guys see a similar effect of social justice warriors, perhaps even a uh, more one or a lesser one, in other industries, so like the arts, in um, entertainment, movies, perhaps? Uh, oh. you, when do you go first this time? Um, I think so. I mean, I, I'm not a. I, you, I think you could see it throughout the the culture, really. I think, and I think it pervades. Um, you know, it's because this is where you see it on campus primarily. Um, you see it in the arts. I think you see it in Hollywood. You certainly see it in the business community. Although it's an interesting phenomenon. It's been going on there for a long time. Uh, not least because businesses are absolutely terrified of of upsetting their customers and, and they're just so afraid of doing that that they'll practically cave to anything. Mm -hmm. But most recently at the, I think it's the Whitney Museum in, in New York, oh. there was a protest of somebody who painted, it's Emmett Till, I think, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. a white painter painted uh, a picture of this, this famous or infamous uh, episode in the civil rights battle when this, this kid was murdered by white supremacists. And there's now a protest against that because on the grounds that a white person can't understand the black experience and they want to not only take the painting down, they want to destroy, destroy the painting, which is crazy. <laughs> and, and the way I think about this is, look, if white people can't paint a, about black experiences, quote black experiences, how can white people even talk to black people or vice versa? Right. That's the yeah. destruction of our ability to communicate. Um, which is really a negative sign. This is such and a destructive thing. Yeah, it's I, I, divisive it's scary and it's it's alienating people, making friendship yeah. impossible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and when you make race and gender and yeah. so salient and then people are always walking on eggshells and you just want to retreat yeah. into your safe space with people <laughs> just like you or no one's going to be offended. By the way, the reason that I love the term oppression Olympics is because mm -hmm. that's what this has become. Oh, yeah. So for example, they just announced last week that the LA Gay Pride Parade is going to not be a parade, there will be no floats, there will be no joyous music and all that stuff. It's now a protest. Now, gay people have equal rights in America. It doesn't mean that everything's perfect for the entire LGBT community, but once a year, they had that one day. I used to live in West Hollywood right by it. I don't even like it. I don't like having that much fun in the middle of the day. It's not for me. But I respect that people get out there and dress up and have a good time. It's great for the economy and all this stuff. But now they've decided that it has to be a protest because they need their groups to be oppressed. Mm -hmm. So, whoa, 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 gays, you, you can't just be celebrating. We need you to be oppressed because they need everybody to feel bad. So, because it's really a way of controlling you, yes. it's not a way of freeing you. Right. Uh, so, in terms of like the kind of whole lexicon of social justice that's popped up recently, you have terms like Steve had mentioned Islamophobia. Uh, I think Christina had mentioned safe spaces. Is there any one term that perhaps irks you the most? Microaggression. <laughs> 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 oh, it's macro annoying. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. I like it that. really is, uh, and it it it's wonderful because a few weeks ago a psychologist at Emory University published a paper where he just evaluated the quality of the research behind the microaggression movement. Mm -hmm. And his name is Scott Lilienfeld, Lilienfeld, and he found that there's just no evidence that, the, that, for example, a majority of women or people of color or people of gay, straight, that, that gay people are offended by certain words. Uh, there's no evidence that you know, if we can select a, some very hateful words and you'd find a lot of people offended, but these, these lists of microaggressions include things like uh, t complimenting a woman on her shoes in a professional <laughs> setting. You're free to do that. <laughs> your shoes are lovely, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> really, really nice. uh, and, and asking uh, an, an Asian or an Asian American or Latino, where are you from? That implies that they're 
alien, not American, yeah. never will be. I ask everybody where they're yes, from. Yes, and guess what? People like telling yeah. you where they're from and what food they grew yeah. up with. And you're not entitled to tell someone they can't wear their hair a certain way yeah. because it upsets you. Right. It's your head. You want to spike it? Go ahead. You want to leave it that way? Go ahead. That's the point. It's, that's what I mean when I say it's about control. They're trying to control you through language. They're not trying to free you, which yeah. is what they should be trying to do. And it destroys the as Christina pointed out before, it destroys the ability of people to be human and enjoy what it is to be human, which is interacting with other people. Right. Hey, where are you from? You know, wow, that's really interesting. I'd like to actually know more about that. No, 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 no. microaggression. You know, uh, uh, all kinds of uh, cultural pro appropriation. Well, can we just talk, maybe? <laughs> you know, you remember the, the the controversy at Yale where Erica Christakis wrote that email about the the Halloween costumes. And part of her point was, how about this? How about if we treat Yale University students as though they're adults? And if they're pissed off about something that you know somebody else wears in a Halloween costume, maybe they can talk to each other and actually deal with each other the way human beings have to deal and the way adults have to deal. I mean, they're going to go out in the world one day, and they're going to have to navigate all these things. So all of these terms, they all they act as a kind of barrier to people interacting and thinking on their own and really evaluating the world. And then I would say you could sum up the the. I mean, there's a grain of legitimacy to all these ideas, but I would sum it up in a kind of old-fashioned way. Be polite. Be respectful to people. Be prepared to be criticized if you say something stupid and then say, hey, you know what, that never occurred to me. Yeah, I'm sorry that I said that about you. Let's get to know each other a little bit better or whatever. Or let's not be friends anymore and then go our separate ways. But yeah. Well, that being said, you don't have to do that, too, yeah. which is your point. Yeah. You don't have to be polite. You yeah, don't have that's to be that's nice. true. But someone may tell you to... to F you know, that you're a jerk. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying the F word to them. You know, not, you know, conservatives and, you know. Uh, Okay, so I think the point that um, I'm going to, I guess, leave us with is that we seem to be hitting around the fact that we need more speech on campus and not less. And a lot of these things, microaggressions, uh, PC culture, safe spaces, they all prevent people from getting their ideas out when it really needs to be more dialogue. There needs to be more debate, discussion. So that's something I really look forward to seeing you guys talk about tonight. And thank you very much for your time. Thank, thank you. you.